that helps if I push the record button. Um, the temple, at the time this prophecy was given, the temple had long been finished. Without strong leadership, the Jews drifted into the ungodly ways. So, some were using idolatrous means, believing that these would bring good rain and good crops. Zechariah tells them to stop such practices and trust in God alone. And then, um, so we read in the second part of the second verse, so my people are wandering around like lost sheep. They are attacked because they have no shepherd. And, you know, a spirit-filled pastor, blessed with strong leadership skills and devoted to God, is a tremendous blessing sent from God. And we should be thankful for and supportive of them. And I know I'm, I appreciate my pastor. He's a good guy. Okay. Okay, we're going to go to verses three through five. Okay. My anger burns against your shepherds, and I will punish these leaders, for the Lord of heaven's armies has arrived to look after Judah, his flock. He will make them strong and glorious, like a proud war horse in battle. From Judah will come the cornerstone, the tent peg, the bow for battle, and from the rulers, they will be like mighty war warriors in battle, trampling their enemies in the mud under their feet. Since the Lord is with them as they fight, they will overthrow even the enemy's horsemen. So God is angry with Israel's leaders because they have no concern for the people that they rule. God will replace them with strong, stable, dependable leaders who in God's strength will overthrow throw the ruling power. Okay. We're going to go into verse six. I will strengthen Judah and save Israel. I will restore them because of my compassion. It will be as though I had never rejected them. For I am the Lord, their God, who will hear their cries. And God hears our cries. When we cry out to him, he loves us more than anything. We're all special to him. And he hears our cries and he will answer our prayers. Okay, and we're going to go to verse 12. By my power, I will make my people strong. And by my authority, they will go wherever they wish. I, the Lord, have spoken. So in response to God's grace, his people will worship and obey him. Okay, now we're going to go to um, chapter 11 of Zechariah. And, uh, and this chapter tells of two short plays about leadership in which he acts the part of a shepherd representing the leaders of God's people. In the first play, Zechariah acts the part of a good shepherd. Verses four through six tells of the flock he cared for that is intended for slaughter. Okay, and we're going to read verse seven. So I cared for the flock intended for slaughter, the flock that was oppressed. Then I took two shepherd's staffs and named them, named one favor and the other union. I got rid of their three evil shepherds in a single month. And then in verse verse eight. Okay, um, let's see here. Let me find it. Okay. But I became impatient with these sheep, and they hated me too. So I told them, I won't be your shepherd any longer. If you die, you die. If you are killed, you're killed. And let those who remain 
devour each other. So the people were really hard to shepherd for Zechariah, and he had had it with the people. And uh, let's see, Zechariah broke his two sticks to show the people that he would no longer be their shepherd in verses 10. Then I took my staff called favor and cut it in two, showing that I had revoked the covenant that I had made with all nations. That was the end of my covenant with them. The suffering flock was watching me, and they knew that the Lord was speaking through my actions in verse 14. Then I took the other staff, union, and cut it in two, showing the bond of unity between Judah and Israel was broken. Okay, and in 12 and 13, and, and I, Zechariah, said to them, if you like, give me my wages, whatever I'm worth, but only if you want to. So they counted out my wages, or my wages, 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, this magnificent sum at which they valued me. So I took the 30 coins and threw water in the temple of the Lord. So when Zechariah suggested that they might pay him for his wages, they gave him such a small amount that it was an insult. And the amount the people valued their godly leadership was 30 pieces of silver, which is the same amount temple leaders valued Jesus at when they paid for Judas, paid Judas for our precious Lord. In Matthew 26, 14 through 16, and 27, 1 through 9. How do we value Jesus? That just makes us think, okay? How do we really feel about God, about Jesus deep within? How do we value him? How do we value him and God's leadership that he places over us? It's simply incalculable. There's no price. I mean, he is just everything. And in verses 15 through 17, then the Lord said to me, go again and play the part of a worthless shepherd. Okay, so this is the second play that Zechariah uh, plays out to the, the people. This illustrates how I will give this nation a shepherd who will not care for those who are dying, nor look after the young, nor heal the injured, nor feed the healthy. Instead, this shepherd will eat the meat of the fattest sheep and tear off their hooves. So if you, when we read this, the opposite of the bad shepherd would be a good shepherd. That's what how God cares for us, his flock. So that would be, so it would be to care for those who are dying, to look after the young, to heal the injured, to feed the healthy, and things like this are what good shepherds do and and uh, good leadership and that's how god cares for his people because he loves us okay and we're going to go to revelation oh let me back up a minute in my notes um so what we just read is the second play where zechariah played the part of a bad shepherd which was the sort of shepherd israel wanted they preferred a bad shepherd. I don't get it. This cruel and selfish leadership was what the people deserved and would be God's means of punishing them. So we're going to Revelation 18, 1 through 24. The announcement of her fall, the fall of Babylon. So in verses 1 and 2. After all this, I, John, saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority the and the earth grew bright with his splendor he gave a mighty shout 
Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen. She has become a home for demons. She is a hideout for every foul spirit, a hideout for every foul vulture and for every foul and dreadful animal. And then in verses four through five, then I heard another voice calling from heaven. Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. For her sins are piled as high as heaven. That's bad. And God remembers her evil deeds. And God is always calling upon us, his people, to cut their connection with sin and to stand with him and for him. He always gives people a chance. And then we read about the doom of pride in verses six through eight. Due to her, as she has done to others, double her penalty for all her evil deeds. She brewed a cup of terror for others, so brewed twice as much for her. She glorified herself and lived in luxury, so match it now with torment and sorrow. She boasted in her heart, I am the queen on my throne. I am no helpless widow, and I have no reason to mourn. Therefore, these plagues will overtake her in a single day, death and mourning and famine. She will completely be completely consumed by fire, for the Lord God who judges her is mighty. So mighty. So that that uh, speaks in terms of punishment. Vengeance belongs to God and to God alone. That is so comforting. Vengeance belongs to God. I say again. Two truths we need to remember. One, the first one is there is this spiritual law: that which a man sows. That shall he also reap. Galatians in Galatians 7 is where we find that in the Bible. The double punishment and the double reward come from the fact that frequently in Jewish law, anyone responsible for loss or damage had to repay it twice over. That's in Exodus 22. There's no getting away from the fact that punishment follows sin especially if that sin has involved the cruel treatment of mankind. And the second truth we must always remember is the truth that pro all pride will one day be humiliated. And then we go on to read in verses 9 through 10. And the kings of the world who committed adultery with her and enjoyed her great luxury will mourn for her as they see the smoke rising from her charred remains. They will stand at a distance terrified by her great torment. They will cry out, how terrible for you, O Babylon, you great city. In a single moment, God's judgment came on you. And then we, it goes on to read about the dirge sung by the merchants in verses six, 11 through 16. And then the dirge sung by the shipmasters and the sailors in 17 through 19. We'll read that 17 through 19. In a single moment, all the wealth of the city is gone and all the captains of the merchant ships and their passengers and sailors and crews will stand at a distance. They will cry out as they watch the smoke ascend, and they will say, where is there another city as great as this? And they will weep, throw dust on their heads to show their grief, and they will cry out, how terrible, how terrible for that great city. The ship owners became wealthy by their transporting her great wealth on the seas. In a single moment, it is all gone.
And then in verses 21 through 20 through 24, we read about the finality of her doom of Babylon. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a huge millstone. He threw it into the ocean and shouted, just like this, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down with violence and will never be found again. The sound of harps, singers, flutes, and trumpets will never be heard in you again. No craftsmen and no trades will ever be found in you again. The sound of the mill will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The happy voices of brides and grooms will never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the greatest in the world and you deceived the nations with your sorceries. In your streets flowed the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people and the blood of people slaughtered all over the world. So yes, the judgment day is going to come for Babylon and for everyone who uh, is, has just never called out to God and for forgiveness of their sins that they committed. And they just were driven by the devil to just live just an unholy, ungodly life, thinking only of themselves, never calling out to God. And that's a terrible place for a soul to be in because God is the judge. And one day he will judge everyone. And uh, so we're going to go on to read uh, some out of Psalm 146, 1 through 10. Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they will return to earth. And all the, their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper. Amen. Whose hope is in the Lord their God. He made heaven and earth the sea, and everything in them. He keeps his promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and the widows. But he frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God. O Jerusalem, throughout the generations. Praise the Lord. So we, we as God's children are so blessed. The God of heaven's armies is our God. And when the devil comes against us, he does, the devil doesn't have to answer to us. In our strength, in our power, the children of God, we, have, we don't have any strength or power aside from God. The devil has to answer ultimately to God. And so when he brings his wickedness against us, we hide under the shadow of God's wing. And, and we put up, we keep trusting in God and waiting on God just 
to get us through the things that we have to face in this life that aren't easy. You know, he never promised it would be easy every day of our lives, but he did promise us that when we wait upon the Lord, he would renew our strength. We would run and not grow weary. We would not walk and not faint. So our strength comes from God, who sent his own son to the world for each one of us. And God wants us to live in his fullness, in his promises, trusting him every day leaning on him every day and just fully devoting ourselves, our lives to him. So we're going to read the wisdom nugget from Proverbs. Proverbs 30, 33. As the beating of cream yields butter and striking the nose causes bleeding, so stirring up anger causes quarrels. That is so true. So I hope everyone has a good day and I want to wish everyone a happy new year and I just pray that God's blessings would be upon us all and uh, that we just keep getting stronger and stronger in God as we look to him and keep his commandments and obey him every day of our lives. God bless you.